Welcome to On My Way to Wealth, the podcast where busy Gen Xers can learn financial tips as they navigate life on their way to wealth. And now, please join your host, Luis Rosa. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of On My Way to Wealth, Hispanic Heritage Month edition. My name is Luis Rosa, and I'm your host. Hispanic Heritage Month takes place from September 15th to October 15th every year as a time to recognize and celebrate the many contributions, culture, and extensive histories of the American Latino community. It first began as a Hispanic Heritage Week in 1968 and later on became Hispanic Heritage Month in 1988. Since then, the month has been celebrated nationwide through festivals, art shows, conferences, community gatherings, and much more. The reason it starts on September 15th is because it celebrates the independence days of several Latin American countries, including Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua on September 15th, Mexico on September 16th, and Chile on September 18th. They also include holidays that recognize Hispanic contributions, such as the Virgin Islands Puerto Rico Friendship Day, which is celebrated in the U.S. Virgin Islands the second Monday in October. For this month, I'd like to highlight individuals who have made a great contribution in their chosen profession and the community at large. So now I'd like to introduce you today to our very special guest, Elizabeth Suarez. A highly sought after leadership and negotiation strategist, Elizabeth Suarez is committed to helping professionals and their organizations establish working environments where people are empowered to be skilled leaders and negotiators. After climbing the ranks of corporate America, she spent the last decade creating the impactful and interactive platform Negotiation Unleashed, a coaching, training, and facilitation resource for professionals. As a previous corporate executive turned negotiation influencer, she created this platform to guide leaders into thriving decision makers and strategists. Elizabeth holds an MBA from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business and a BS in Chemical Engineering from Conner University. She completed the executive management program at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. She is a graduate of the Center for Creative Leadership, National Hispanic Leadership Institute, NHLI, and Leadership in Denver. She is a certified MBTI practitioner and mediator trained by the Colorado Council of Mediators and the Colorado Bar Association. And now, without further ado, Elizabeth Suarez. Welcome, Elizabeth. Hola, thank you. Thank you for having me, Luis. It is an honor. Wow, what an impressive bio. I sound old, I can tell you that. <laughs> I did it all like in five years. <laughs> wow, that is very impressive. In such a, a broad range of things, you know, I was like, what? Uh, chemical, you know, I was like, you know, a whole bunch of things that are, you know, usually you don't think of as going together, right? Yeah, I know. That is amazing. This is great. I want to thank you so much for taking time out to be here on the show today. And I know that the audience is going to be super excited to hear about your journey and all the things you've done. You know, so thank you so much for being here. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm excited. My pleasure. Yeah, so this is a special episode during Hispanic Heritage Month, so I'm glad you were able to make it. And uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about your background, your, you know, your upbringing and career. Perfect. Well, so I come uh, from uh, Cuban parents that lived under communism, and I was raised in La Isla del Encanto, Puerto Rico. And it was there where I formed really my identification of I am a Latina, but I consider myself a Boricua uh, with Cuban heritage. And uh, stayed on the island until I went to college in upstate New York at Cornell and stayed there in that Northeast uh, United States area. Uh, Spent 15 years in corporate America, and uh, it took me from New York City to South America to Denver to Silicon Valley back to Denver. So I have had a really elaborate um, background with corporate America in which I started as an engineer, then I got my MBA and went into management and into business development across a variety of industries from uh, pharmaceuticals to uh, good you know, products um, for people like uh, Pepsi-Cola. I worked for Pepsi-Cola and concluded my career in the telecom industry. So I was very much involved in everything, high-speed data and all the wonderful stuff that uh, is taken for granted these days with all the content we have. So I was there at the beginning with the Apples and the Googles of the world that now they're just multinationals. (laughs) Right, that you can't escape and they're everywhere, right? Wow. Exactly, and uh, I am devoted to their products. (laughs) What can (laughs) I say? (laughs) 
Amazing. So tell me, uh, how was it like uh, assimilating to the culture? I can tell you, I call it the me, myself, and I syndrome when I was in corporate America, which I was amazed that there were not that many other females, Latinas, and then with an accent. Oh my God, I was it. Uh, people knew who I was because of my accent. And I was like, okay, this is ridiculous. It got to a point very lonely. I will admit it to you. That is the reason why I left corporate America because I was so tired and I went up the ranks. I mean, I was reporting directly to CEOs. So it's not that I was in the middle of the pack. I was reporting into CEOs, being flown around the world and the country in private jets with CEOs in order to conduct business. But I just got to a point that I felt alone with the me, myself, and I syndrome. So that's when I said, I'm going to go and I am actually going to stop this madness of being the only one. And that's the reason why I started Negotiation on Leech Platform, where I came to realize that no matter what education you have, if you cannot negotiate, and if you cannot feel comfortable with your own leadership style, I don't care who you are, unless you're a white man that has been given silver spoon and nothing against white men, I adore all of them, but because they come from a different network, they have access to the people that make decisions. Coming as a Latina, as a Latino, we do not have access to those networks. So hence the reason it's so important that we do understand what it is to network and what it is to negotiate effectively and what is our leadership style. That's the reason I started my negotiation on this platform. Gotcha. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, because you you were from inside and you saw, I need to change this from, from the inside out. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. And actually what I'm now doing contributing is that my executive coaching is mainly focused on executives at the C-suite. Because I'm realizing that, yeah, in the middle, we can get everybody trained And we can get them really empowered. But if we don't have those C-suite executives believing that this works and believing that a change needs to happen, I don't care how trained you get, you're always going to be hitting that glass ceiling. And that goes for Latino men. This is not just Latina women. This also goes for Latino men. And this also goes for other people of color. So that's why now my, my coaching, even though I still coach, Uh, Latinos and Latinas, mainly I'm coaching those C-suite executives because I need to be an influencer that is that change agent that makes those executives realize there has to be a change. That makes sense, yeah. That makes sense, yeah, because then you have a much greater impact. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly, at this point. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, What do you think is uh, one of the ways that your Hispanic background has shaped your career? I think the main thing is that no matter how great you are, no matter how well prepared you are, it's all about your community. And your community can be defined differently. Like Luis, you can have a different definition of community. Like I can have a different definition of community, but I am not by myself. So if my community is not thriving, if my community is not being empowered, I don't care how much education I have, I don't care how many Harvard certificates and diplomas or Oxford or whatever other Ivy League you want to put on the wall, I am not going to succeed because I need my community. I do not stand by myself. So that's one thing that I want to make sure that Latinos realize is I have started to see some Latinos and also some women going up those corporate ladders and they sort of forget where they're coming from, where they come from. And I'm like, you know what? Basta no mas. You, this is not the game how we're playing. We're not playing the white man game. Right. We're playing, the, playing the Latino game in a white man game that we can actually be equal to him. So that's something that uh, that is my main focus when I'm working with Latinos. And actually, currently, I am now coaching a Latino CEO. And even with him, he has been amazed. He even told me, he says, I have assimilated so much in order for me to survive this fortune world, company world that I am a part of, that I have forgotten where I sometimes my, my, my starting point. Yeah. So I, I, so I, that's a thing that people need to realize. This is a reality. We need to remember where we came from and we need to also realize that we did not get there by ourselves. I like that. They say uh, a rising tide lifts all boats, right? So exactly. I love that approach. It's great. There has been an abuela, a tia, 
the best friend, uh, an enemy, <laughs> whatever you want to say out there that actually contributed to the pedestal that you're standing on. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of which, uh, who has or have been some of the most influential people in your life? I will start. Uh, she has passed, which is mi madre, my Cuban mother. She came, uh, you know, leaving Cuba with everything that she had in Cuba and leaving it with my father that when they got to Puerto Rico, they realized he had an incurable disease, which meant that she became a widow a few years after uh, they arrived. So then she was left with four little kids with an education. And what she came to realize, no money, she realized the only thing that they can they cannot take away from you is your education. So she focused on her four children so we could get educated. But at the same time, she says, the other thing that once you receive the education you have to do is you have to look behind you and help the people behind you. And you also have to pay it forward. So since we have been, since I have graduated from college um, and I got my first paycheck, my mother actually sat down with me and informed me that there was a percentage that I was going to have to contribute to a nonprofit of my choice, wow. whoever, that would help people. And I have been contributing to that nonprofit since I turned 21 years old. Wow. So, and I am way away. So just for about 10 years or so, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 12. <laughs> exactly. But it's something that my mother taught me that. She said, yes, we got educated. You got educated. You had a group of people behind you that helped you get educated. Um, I will give kudos to Cornell University. I went to Cornell University on a full ride because at the time I went, the president of Cornell University, President Rhodes, that actually passed last year, he believed and actually increasing the amount of Latinos at Cornell University. And he picked several of us, and I went on a full ride to Cornell University. So I am thankful to people like that, and I have to do the same to other people that come behind me. So my focus has been placed very much, I'm very focused on Latina women professionals. So I have spent the last 20 years um, mentoring uh, Latinas. And every year I mentor two or three Latinas. And when I say mentor, you can ask any of the people that I have mentored. I become your mother. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I am at your baby shower. I'm at wow. your, I have been to a divorce party. Teresa, wow. I'm telling you, I have been to funerals. I literally get into your life and I am the one that will push you. I will be that mother that will say, ¿Y por qué tú estás haciendo esto? Why are you doing this? And I can tell you, all these mujeres are like, yeah. oh, oh. put that mirror up. <laughs> exactly. And I still keep in touch with them. I, I have it that I, the first two women I mentored, they're now um, amazing professionals, uh, 40, 41 years old. And to this day, they still laugh. They're like, oh my God, my, the phone, which they say that when they see the phone and they see my name, they like answer it like, hi, hola, yeah, hi, how are you? <laughs> like sometimes <laughs> they're afraid that I'm calling, but I'm just calling to check in. And that's one thing, that's one of the ways that I do it. Plus the way that my mother asked me that I needed to, because money also talks that I needed to invest in a cost that I am very close to me. And the cost is actually an organization that helps uh, girls, Latina girls from El Barrio to get educated. So I actually contribute to that uh, organization. So, I, I mean, it's, it's that we all have to do this because I am not here because, oh, Elizabeth Suarez is wonderful. No, it's not that. It's because yeah. a lot of people worked their tail off and believed in me. Yeah. And this is it's a bigger focus. I like that because it's not just like work hard so that you can get the good job. It's like, that's just part of it. And you're going to help other people come up as well. Exactly. Extending exactly. that ladder. No, I, I, that's, that's really a very sound advice. That's amazing that she oh, built that. You. Yeah. Instilled that in you, you know, that's amazing. So tell me, how did you get to where you are today? So like, how did you go from like corporate world? Was there a moment when you were like, you know, I'm just going to go on my own and start my own business and do my own <laughs> program? Yeah, I think it was the year that my husband became very scared. <laughs> it was, I was actually rising. I mean, I was, I mean, I was doing very well in the telecom industry and ended up in an amazing company that then got bought out by Comcast. And uh, Comcast uh, basically said, well, you know what? We want you now in Philadelphia. You're going to be leading this group. And that's how it goes. And at the time I had 
uh, two um, stepdaughters that lived with us that were in high school. I had an elderly mother living with us and I had a little girl that happens to be my daughter. And I just said, I cannot move them again. I mean, I, the moving that I have done, like what I mentioned to you, it was really New York, Philly, back to New York, um, you know, South America, back to New York, Denver, Silicon Valley, back to Denver. I mean, I got to a point that I'm like, I can't continue doing this. This is insane. So I, at that moment, um, did the National Hispanic Leadership Institute, which was uh, for 30 years, an organization that focused on uh, basically developing Latinas throughout the country. And they would pick 20 to 22 of us on an annual basis from different sectors, from the private to the corporate to government sector. And they would put us together for four weeks and make us leaders. I mean, and I can tell you it was from that experience that I realized that I need to be more of an influencer and just staying in corporate America and going all over the place, it's going to be so narrow that I need to, my reach needs to be wider. So I came to realize that I was an excellent negotiator when I negotiated one of the best severance packages I have ever heard in my life. Even my husband was like, how much, how much did you get? I mean, he, he couldn't even believe it. Even for today's dollars, it's ridiculous the wow. amount I negotiated. And I basically said, well, okay, I'm doing it. And I just got home and I remember informing my husband and saying, look how amazing. And he was like, oh, wow, wow. He says, so what's the next step? I said, I have no idea. And he was like, <laughs> what's the strategy? I said, I have no strategy. And he was like, okay, well, uh, uh, let me, I mean, I remember he like left the room because I think he was like, like, like he couldn't believe it. And so uh, it really took me a year and a half in which I really deep down got and assessed myself. I reached out to, to some main mentors, talked to them. I mean, heard very difficult feedback. And then I came to realize where I can be a, the greatest influencer is if I am able to develop a platform where I can reach, not only empower the people I want to empower, but at the same time, have access to the individuals that can make a difference to the people I want to empower. Hence the reason I started Negotiation Unleashed. Hence the reason my executive coaching is focused on that C-suite executive. I still will do executive coaching to the middle management in order to move them up. But my platform also includes not only coaching, but a lot of training, a lot of facilitation, and also a lot of videoing. I have created different video series that even if it's at three o'clock in the morning, you're trying to figure out what's next. You can go to my speaker, uh, Elizabeth Suarez YouTube channel and find something that can hopefully help you and motivate you and for you to stay at the course and get the goal you want to reach. Got it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I want to ask you a little bit more in depth about negotiation on leash. So when it comes to coaching, like what do you do with these individuals? <laughs> Other than scream at them and saying that how mad I am. No, I'm just <laughs> Kidding. Actually, that's a very good question. I, I do it very, and this is the engineer in me. I do it very methodical. I have an approach in which it first starts with like some sort of feedback. Uh, so I do it from an assessment perspective of figuring out what are their leadership styles as well as what are their negotiation styles to a feedback of what is their community saying to them. And that means their peers. That means as if it's a CEO above them, which means the board of directors and also the people that they lead uh, below them. So um, I gather that information. It's all anonymous. Obviously, they, uh, the people know who they are because they actually introduced me to these people. So I have access to them. And then I create uh, a feedback report of saying, this is what I heard. And some of it, the majority of it is very positive because for you to become a C-suite executive, you have to be good at it. I mean, you, have, you can't, not everybody becomes that. So your capabilities and your skills and your knowledge and knowledge are extremely strong. However, now we get into what I call that return on your relationships. That is where they need to excel better, uh, a little bit more. And that's where the leadership styles and the negotiation styles come in, in which then I work with them. I form an engagement with them of X amount of months. Some of them have uh, kept me for a couple of years in which we work on those soft skills. And I hate to use that terminology, soft skills, because I call them the most difficult skills. This is not something that you read and you implement like an engineer and you do, whoop, got it done. This is something that you have to grow with. 
and you have to continue sustaining it and gathering more information and more feedback so the sustainability and the accountability is real and transparent and you evolve as a leader. So that's what I do with them. So I try to make it as quantitative as possible at the beginning so they can understand the direction we're taking. But then we go into the qualitative approach and that's what I really like because I'm basing it on all this research and data And then now we're talking about real life. I mean, it is stuff that they talk to me about that, that, that I I just sit there and I do, oh yeah, I I lived that example that you just gave me. And guess what? I lived that on the other side, not on your side. And trust me, I can tell you, it's not that pleasant (laughs) to live it on the other side. (laughs) So that's what I'm working with them. And what I, what I have seen that is hopeful, Luis there's more and more C-suite executives that are saying, you know what, I need help. But at the same time, I do not announce who they are. Um, I keep it very respectful, anonymous. It's their right to say what they want to say if they want to admit that they even have a coach. A lot of them admit that they have coaches, but they will not say who are their coaches. Uh, But you know, it's it's great work. It's a very intense work. Uh, My sessions with them are always 90 minutes. I need um, uh, like a 45 minute hour break after each session because it really, like it really burns me out and they do the same. So a lot of my sessions, I'm glad that I work in different time zones are like before lunch or before they go home because they say they can't go into another meeting just from the sessions. And it's not that it's terrible, the session's negative, it's that it's intense vetting, processing, admitting, and trying to figure out what to do next. That's yeah, why. I, I can imagine. Yeah, it sounds pretty intense. It is intense. But that's why it's so effective, right? <laughs> it is. And, and it gives me hope because they realize that they need to do this because they realize they are the leaders and they admit it. And they also admit that they like to be the leaders and rightfully so, they should be the leaders, but they need to also continue evolving. And the Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. So let me pivot here a little bit. And can you tell us a little bit about The Art of Getting Everything, your book? Yes, this is a book that I wrote uh, four years ago. Thank you for asking. It is a bestseller. And uh, what I like about the book, it's a book uh, that I have been informed by my um, you know, my printing uh, com- company, my representative, that you read it in 79 minutes. That's what he informed me. I'm like, okay, great. I'm glad that it took you 79 minutes to read. But it's a book that I created as a manuscript, as a way to motivate and aware you about negotiation and make you aware that negotiation is not just about the deal. The negotiation is about the deal, which is your career, but it's also about two other pillars that can really affect your career. And many times we overlook them. One of them is your family, the family, your family demands that many times we take for granted. Even as Latinos, many times we're like, oh, you know what, at Christmas, I'll catch up with her. Mm. You know, maybe you shouldn't wait until Christmas to talk to your tia. I'm just saying it as experience, personal experience, you need to talk to your tia more more often than (laughs) than once a year at Christmas. And the other one is interest, which I call the recharging of your batteries. And we, that's the one, even as Latinos, we're worse than non-Latinos. We overlook that one. We say, you know what? We are young. We have the energy. We, you know, we were raised by the strong men and women that were raised and we will never give up. Well, guess what? You need to recharge your batteries and you need to figure out how are you going to do it on a weekly basis? And that's where they all like, I don't have time for this. So I basically developed this book as my way of when I am coaching you or if I'm mentoring you as a Latina, that you have this book that if I win the lottery and I decide to go to some Pacific Island and live the rest of my life without even caring about the rest of you, that you have something you can refer back to. That's why I wrote the book. I am not a writer, Luis. I do not like to write books. I am a presenter. I like to speak. And also I like to be in front of videos, but I'm not the writer. So I will write all the scripts you want me to write, but I would not want to write another book, even though my, you know, my printer, my my representative, my editor, you know, a company keeps on saying, hey, do you want it to go for a second book? I'm like, no, not really. (laughs) 
I may change, you know, maybe when I'm on that Pacific Island or that Caribbean Island, I may say, bring it. Let me write the second book. I don't know. I maybe. Uh, yeah. Where would you go? Like San Juan or? Well, I would, to tell you the truth, I think I would like to go back. If I decide to end my life on an island, I will go back to Puerto Rico only because, but I would not go to San Juan, believe it or not. I would go out of, uh, out of San Juan to a small town And I would just be there and be that abuela that the little kids will want to come and just talk to, even though I'm not their abuela, and just hang out. Be that old lady it. that they can say anything and I will make them laugh. That would be, if I end up like that in my life, I know I, I did a full circle. I, I could see that. And, and then you're just like <laughs> giving those nuggets of knowledge too, you know? And also enjoying their enjoying them, seeing them grow and watch them grow. That for me, that will be priceless. That would be awesome. Well, here's something that I was thinking about as you were describing how you don't like to write, but you do like to present and speak. You could probably speak your next book. <laughs> I know, you know, my yes, my editor has been saying that. Elizabeth, you love to speak because I see you. Just turn on that little feature right. on your iPhone and you can <laughs> have your next book. And I'm like, yes, I know. Yeah, that would be great. And speaking of the book, by the way, for those of you listening, if you like the podcast, go leave a review and take a screenshot of it. Send me an email at luis at onmywaytowealth.com for the first 10 people who do that. Elizabeth has been kind enough to offer a signed copy of her best-selling book. So again, just leave us a review, take a screenshot of it, send an email at luis at onmywaytowealth.com, and then I'll send you the information on how to get that signed copy of this book. Great. Thank you for that opportunity. I look forward to actually signing those. And I will make it customized signing. I'm not going to just put my name. When I sign books, I actually write something on it. Awesome. I like that. Well, I'm going to need a sign copy myself too. So. Yeah, I, for, <laughs> for supuesto, yes. That's yes. Yeah, I look forward to that. So um, I want to make sure that I'm going to put your contact information on the show notes for those listening. Just go to onmywaytowealth.com. You can get all of uh, Elizabeth's social media and website, but I'd like you to also mention in case somebody happens to be just driving or at the gym, uh, how can people get in touch with you? The best way is going to my website, negotiationunleashed.com. And there, there is a contact uh, way that you can send me a message and the message comes directly to me. It does not come to any of my team members. So I want to clarify that. I have not allowed any of my team members to receive my messages. And then the other one, if you are working out right now in the gym, hop over to YouTube, put speaker Elizabeth Suarez and watch some of my videos. My videos are short and to the point. I don't have time to waste and I don't think anybody else has time to waste. So in five minutes, I will give you tips of what to do. Nice. I, I'm all, every video, there is a tip. I do not just talk to talk. I love it. I love it. Uh, hopefully we can put this on video as well. This, this would be a longer video than, than your usual tips, but. <laughs> no, but at least, you know, I have a sidekick you. So it's much placentero, so easier than me just talking for an hour. I mean, come on, who does That's that? That's true. A lot of people, but. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. I enjoy doing the interview podcast as well, more than just me talking for a half hour, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Without a doubt. Can you tell me what were some of the resources you had um, that you wish you had growing up that could have helped you on your way? You know, one of them is uh, people that looked like me, that had my accent, people that had my background, that they could be available. I mean, as a female, and um, that was not there. I mean, actually, I have to admit it. My mother was one of the only one, few women that like we're educated with a profession, which for me, I look back and I go, oh my God, uh, she really was a trailblazer that she worked through all of our lives. I mean, she never stayed home uh, with us. So that that's one thing. Another one is actually access to information that is relevant. Uh, a lot of the information, especially, you know, back in my era, there was no Google. So, you know, I had to go to the library and do those little you know, things that you had to go, the, the little uh, uh, drawers that you had to like figure out. A, a, yeah, a go to the stacks. And the stacks and everything. And the articles, the books were so theoretical that they were not practical. So that's why I'm focusing. And yes, I believe the theory is important. And I will leave that to all the universities and all the professors out there to do that. But the practicality, especially for Latinos and Latinas, is so important. It is so much needed. So if I could start living again, and if I was 2021, 20, 
that's what I would look for. I would look for a mentor that would look like me, sound like me. And then I would look for who out there in YouTube or whatever, Spotify, whatever podcast, like your podcast with Luis, who is out there that can give me some insights that are practical? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you know, you're, you're so right. I went to school, got a, a Bachelor of Arts in Economics, but at the end of the day, like, it was all theory. <laughs> it was, I had no practical skills after a four-year degree, and I was lucky enough to then be introduced to this career as a financial planner, and, and then I focused on that, on, on being practical. Like, here's actual things you could do to improve your life, not just theory about, you know, just general stuff, which is great. Yeah, so that, that is such a great point. So what helped me also, I can tell you, was when I was at 21 years old, when I started working for my first Fortune 100 company, which was Johnson & Johnson as a chemical engineer. And I walked in there with all the theory, you can imagine, you know, coming from an Ivy League, like, oh, I have everything like that. And they threw me, <laughs> I say <laughs> threw me because that's how I felt, threw me in one of their manufacturing plants of Tylenol makers. And they were like, okay, you're going to supervise these people. And I'm like, are you like kidding me? <laughs> like, wait a second. Like, I need an office. I need to like look at, uh, at exp- at spreadsheets. <laughs> I mean, I mean, and they were like, I know we have to like get this stuff out. And let me tell you the deadlines. And I appreciate so much that Johnson and Johnson gave me that practical experience that at the beginning, the first six months, it was such a learning curve. I mean, it, it wasn't that they're going to let me fail. Obviously they had invested in me, but it was such reality that they even said it. They said, don't you love it? How you get all this great education and nothing is practical. (laughs) I'm glad that since I have graduated, it's gotten a little bit better, a little bit more practical, but it needs to be even more practical. Agreed. Agreed. What do you feel is still lacking or unavailable today for Latinx and Hispanics as they work to achieving their goals? Uh, What's lacking is the access to the decision makers. And I'm not only saying in the C-suite, I'm even saying in higher ed, uh, from community colleges to Ivy Leagues, uh, access to some community leaders. Uh, The community leaders, many times that happen to be Latinos or Latinas, uh, it's like very, very localized. Like, let's like start looking at senators in the state level, start looking at DC federal level. And I mean, you can count them in one hand. Okay. I'll give you two hands. Maybe. Yeah. I'm being, I'm trying to be being generous. (laughs) Yeah. I'm trying to be positive here, but that's the problem. Lack of access to seeing examples of what we need to mold ourselves at us in order for us to say, oh, okay, this is what we have. And then access to those individuals that can help us. Because what I have noticed, a lot of these individuals that get to these high levels, then they're so busy. They don't have time to like, I I really can't talk to Maria there. I mean, well, no, you need to talk to the Marias and the Juans. I mean, I, I really don't care. I mean, figure it out at least twice a year. I'm not saying daily, but twice a year, you can set some time aside that how are you going to talk to them and how are you going to give them tips and ideas for them to continue? Because you need to pass the torch. That's the biggest complaint I have of this country right now. We have not passed the torch or gotten the awareness of the next generation to get the next generation ready and pass the torch and say, vaya con Dios, it's time for you. Yeah, And that, that is where I am just doing a little part that I'm going into, you know, obviously the, the professional, the, the corporate and um, private sector, trying to get these C-level people that they need to become, help the next generation be aware, educate them, expose them, and then pass the torch. But it can't only be me. This has to come from all the different pillars in our society. Oh, yeah. It's a whole systemic thing for sure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've noticed that, too, when it comes to money in the Latino community, too. I felt like a lot of the generations just like start from scratch. Mm -hmm. So when you were speaking, I'm like, yeah, that that is just exactly how I see it, too. It's like, yeah, you know, you should do well for yourself and then also teach your kids and have them teach their kids like your mother did. Right. Just like, hey, you got your first patient. Let's sit down and Let's budget this out and here's how much it's going to go to a cause that you care about and, you know, and do the same for other things, right? That, that is so powerful. That can have like transgenerational impact. And I can tell you with my mother was a 3%. She chose uh, 3%. And um, I can tell you net 
3% when you're 21 and you want to like go and buy the latest whatever, you're like, pero espérate, that's too much money. No, 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 that's not too much money. Big chunk, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? You're going to put this through because you have to pay it forward. So no, it's 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 interesting when you're doing it net. I'm not, you know I mean? You're like, oh, three, because net, it's yeah, it's that's... 3% of gross from the, at, at the net. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big chunk. Do you realize how much Uncle Sam takes from you? You're like, <laughs> yeah. And imagine if your parents decide to charge you rent on top of that. Yeah, you're you're in big trouble. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you could have one superpower, what would it be? One superpower that I can reach more people than what I can do. That I can literally, like one on one, be able to sit down with Latinos that want to sit down with me one on one and just dive in and give them some advice. Like, so I, I would need to multiply myself. Like Absolutely. Or, you well, know, whatever. <laughs> I hear a calling for that second book. <laughs> Even the more reason for it. So what is one common misconception that you believe people have about Hispanics or the Hispanic culture in general? That, um, oh God, I'm going to say this and I, I don't want to say that, that we cannot be focused because we love to include everybody and you, you know what I mean? That we cannot get a project done on time or, or get focused on something because we have to include so many people and we need to be part of so much stuff. That's, I mean, and I don't believe in that. I believe that we can do it. The thing is that we do it different. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but we do it. <laughs> we do it, but we don't do it the Anglo way. I mean, and that's okay. Uh, we do it very, very differently. Yeah, as long as it gets done, though, that's what matters, right? Yeah, exactly. makes sense. So let's go into some fun stuff here. I'm going to ask you, uh, what do you love about being Hispanic? What I love, I love the music, I love the food, and I love that I can move my my hips y bailar como una loca. Uh, <laughs> I see my non-Latina friends that I look at them and I do, oh, honey, all those 20 years of Arthur Mary dance classes hasn't helped you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being honest. I mean, that I have that that rhythm and, and Latinos, nor, I mean, you just put, and especially Puerto Ricanos. I know you're from República Dominicana, so you, you have it there too. It's just that those tambores start going and your hips start moving. And I love that we have that. That's ingrained in us. Yes, it is. Without a doubt, it's in our blood. So what is your favorite Latin uh, cuisine? Oh, picadillo con arroz y habichuelas y um, maduros. Ooh, maduros. you had me at maduros. <laughs> <laughs> that is my go-to, and I'm proud to say that I uh, shared it with my daughter, got my daughter involved. So when she graduated from high school last year in May 2019, I did a very special party for her. Uh, I mean, she had her friend's party and everything, but then I did a party of 20 people that had influenced her life. And I said, okay, so you're going to have to Choose oh, wow. what is the catering you want. And she turned to me, she says, I don't want catering. I want you to cook this. So she asked me. So everybody was so impressed that I, I, I cooked this Cuban Puerto Rican type of dinner. And that's what she asked for. Like I, my husband's joke was like, when she gets married, this this what she's going to feed the people? <laughs> <laughs> hey, buffet style, right? <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> or you can eat, go for it. Exactly. Then they'll need a nap afterwards, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me one thing that you're grateful for today. I am grateful that I had an amazing madre, mother that believed in me and showed me the importance of community. Mm, awesome. Now you had mentioned that how you want to like if you had a superpower, you want to like basically duplicate yourself all over, right? So you can have these one-on-ones with people. So Let's say that you had that opportunity to do that. Um, What is the best piece of advice that you would have for all Hispanic men and women out there trying to go after their dream today? I would say, number one, uh, dream big and, uh, and write it down. And then let's dissect it and segment it based on your stages in life. And what can you accomplish in each stage of your life in order for you to reach your ultimate goal? I know you're in financial services, so let's many people, when I hear, when I'm coaching and I'm mentoring younger individuals, 
what they say, they're like, I want to be financially stable. I want to be able to not worry when I'm 50, if uh, social security is even going to be here for me. And even if it's here, like what a joke, what money are they going to give you? Right. So dream that you will be financially stable, dream that you can accomplish that. But now what are you going to do in your twenties? And I would say divide your life into three, like every decade. So at the beginning of your 20s, the middle of your 20s, and the end of the 20s, the same in your 30s, the same in your 40s. What is it that you need to do in all of those three decades in order for you to say at 55, this is what I want? I will give you an example of my husband. My husband is older than I am. And when we were about to get married, that's we're going to celebrate 28 years next month. He said to me, and we were talking, well, you know, we have to get the minister. Oh, thank you. The minister and the priest and everything. He says, that is fine. But he says, but we're going first to a financial planner. If we cannot survive that meeting with a financial planner, we're not getting married. (laughs) I mean, seriously, this is this guy telling me this. And I'm like in my 20s. What? Like, you know, like (laughs) such a foreign concept. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, like, what are you talking about? The best thing we did, and when we went there, the what the financial planner did is that that financial planner made us think, what is your dream? Obviously, the financial planner was doing it from a financial perspective. I learned from her. We've always had a female financial planner. Yeah, I learned from her and I said, you know what? I'm going to do this professionally. So I did that. I did that from a professional standpoint and I did it from a personal family standpoint. And every year I review it. So dream and then divide it into segments. Many times what we do is like, oh, we're just thinking about that dream. You can't, you have to segment it because you can't do everything in one year. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I feel that you might get easily discouraged too. If you have like this grandiose goal and then you're thinking, whoa, how am I going to do this? Right. But if you break it down, um, even like losing weight, something as simple as that, Hey, maybe you could lose a pound a week. You know, you don't need to lose 10 and (laughs) try to wait. Actually, I have a colleague that in two years lost all the weight she wanted and she has kept it off. And her goal was that every week she will feel stronger and that at the end of the month, maybe she will lose two pounds. That's amazing. Yeah, that was it. That was it. It was amazing. Like she said, every month she hit her goal. Just think about it. So I had some cheat days that I still had my cake. I mean, I still had the ice cream, but because I was so focused on the health and it was like, okay, well, two, two pounds a month, you know, who cannot do that? Yeah, that's true. That that's amazing. It, exactly. But it took her two years. This was several years back. Guess what? They've never come back. I mean, the, it, it has stayed off. Yeah. Like she really redid her body. Yeah. And developed the habit. Yeah. I love how you took the financial planning concept and just applied it to your profession and your personal life. And I feel like, um, that is so cool how you even incorporated that in your book, because I know that part of what you mentioned is not just looking at the numbers when looking at a job offer. It's also, hey, what are the qualitative stuff, mm-hmm. uh, the things that are going to impact your personal life and your relationships and your family, right? It's, it's amazing. you know. So I love how you just wrapped all that up and made it all connect. It's a good engineering trait. You like somebody gives you a skill. So I was sitting there taking notes. It wasn't that I was taking notes about what she was saying. I was taking <laughs> notes. How can I extrapolate this? So a couple of things that I learned from financial planning. Number one is compounding interest is real. And that is also compounding interest in your career and also personally. Investing and yourself. number two, holding yourself accountable really works. Absolutely. Yeah. Invest in yourself. That's amazing. Well, for those of you listening, uh, if you want to learn more about Elizabeth, go to Unleashed Negotiation, oh, negotiationunleashed.com. And uh, again, if you are interested in her book for the first 10 people that leave a review, make it a nice one. <laughs> Send a <laughs> screenshot of it to Luis at onmywaytowealth.com. And I will be sure that you get a personalized signed copy of Elizabeth's book. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for being with us on the show. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to getting my personalized copy signed as well. I will. I will. Well, gracias. I really appreciate your, uh, the opportunity to address your audience. Yeah, gracias. Thank thank you you so much. Uh, All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to the show. As always, go to allmywaytowealth.com. I'll have all of Elizabeth's contact information in the show notes as well. And... uh, Yeah, que viva la hispanidad and see you on the next episode.
Thank you for listening to On My Way to Wealth. If you have any questions, please send me an email at louise at onmywaytowealth.com. The information provided here is for information and education purposes only. The opinions expressed herein are solely those of myself, unless otherwise specifically cited. Material presented is believed to be from reliable sources and no representations are made by my firm or myself about other parties' information or accuracy or completeness. All information or ideas provided should be discussed in detail with a financial advisor, accountant, or legal counsel prior to implementation. Thank you.